Hey, dreamer. Sit back and relax. I'll take you to your next dream. Hello, baby. <laughs> yeah, good evening. <laughs> you know, I've noticed that you've been working really hard lately. Mm-hmm. You've pretty much screwed up your sleeping schedule. So, today, I'm going to give you a mandatory rest period. Mm -hmm. Which means no work, no thinking, no worries. I have everything taken care of. Okay? Now, you need to rest. And when I say rest, a proper sleep. Which means no phones, no internet, just you and your dreams. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, no. Don't give me that pouty face. I swear. You humans are too addicted with your technology. Hmm? You're always watching TV, or on the phone, or looking up something on the internet. I know how amazing it is. I know how much you love your cat videos. But I want you to sleep today. Mm-hmm. So, come here, princess. <laughs> you know, you feel a lot lighter. Did you lose some weight? Oh, baby. You know that you're perfect no matter what size you are. Right? Hmm... <laughs> But I do appreciate you trying to look your best for me. It makes me feel really special. <laughs> but just so you know, you're perfect. You look beautiful just the way you are. Now, since I've caught you properly, you're not getting away this time. We're going straight to bed. And I'm going to put you to bed. <laughs> hey, hey. Stop struggling, baby. It's happening whether you like it or not. You need your rest. And I'm making sure it happens if it's the last thing I do. I'll even pin you to the bed with my body. If that's what's necessary. Mm -hmm. And you know how heavy I am, right? <laughs> oh yeah. I'll smother you with my body. <laughs> Alright. Here we are in the bedroom. There. Ah, there you are. Now... That wasn't so hard, right? Getting to bed. <laughs> Honey, look at me. Everything's gonna be okay. It's okay that you rest a little. You deserve it. In fact, you need it. Have you seen the bags in your eyes? You're always concerned with how you look, right? <laughs> well, you need your beauty sleep. And let me tell you, sleeping does wonders to the body and mind. I should know, I'm a dragon. We pretty much sleep most of the day. <laughs> I know, 
You've seen me sleep for 24 hours on end in this cave, right? Yeah, and I always feel invigorated after a good rest. But perhaps for you, since you're human, maybe 24 hours is a bit too much. Go for maybe 8 to 10. Well, if it's uninterrupted sleep, then six hours could even do it. I believe it's not about the length of the rest, but it's the quality of the rest. If you have uninterrupted sleep for six hours, it's much better than a restless sleep for eight hours. So, I've made sure to make that happen. I've uh, talked to our neighbors, you know, those pesky neighbors, to tone it down this evening. And I've prepared the bed nice and fluffy, as you can feel here. Mm-hmm, brand new sheets, and a nice new duvet, fresh from the washing machine. Yeah. Do you like how it smells? I use those liquids you call softeners. It does wonders to pieces of cloth like this. Yeah, I do like the smell. Mm, lavender. Now, let's get you tucked in. There you go. Nice and cozy. I heard that humans have this custom of reading bedtime stories to help them sleep. I bought this fairy tale book. It's filled with a bunch of stories. Maybe it could help you sleep. Would you like to try it? <laughs> Okay, let's see. <clears throat> it's quite the big book. Don't worry, baby. I've brushed up a lot in human calligraphy. Yeah, I can read this. Okay. Now, let's see. Oh, here's a story. It's called Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves. It's got treasure in it. Something I really, really like. And certainly something I can relate to. Like I keep saying, we dragons, we love hoarding treasure. And to see the humans do the same, <laughs> it's actually quite interesting. Yeah, in fact, it's quite hilarious. We've spent centuries thinking we're different, yet we do the same things. We're still prone to greed, and we both have the same capacity for love. Given, some of us take love a bit too far to the realms of obsession. That's why you'll see some dragons hoarding treasure and desperately trying to keep it for themselves. Well, in a way, I'm sort of the same. You're my biggest treasure, baby. And I will never want to give you up to anyone. You're mine and mine alone. <laughs> All right. Are you nice and cozy? Do you have your favorite stuffed animal with you? Good, good. All right. Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves. 
There once lived in a town of Persia two brothers, one named Kasim and the other Ali Baba. Their father divided a small inheritance equally between them. Kasim married a very rich wife and became a wealthy merchant. Ali Baba married a woman as poor as himself and lived by cutting wood and bringing it up upon three donkeys into the town to sell. One day, when Ali Baba was in the forest and had just cut wood enough to load his donkeys, he saw at a distance a great cloud of dust which seemed to approach him. He observed it with attention and distinguished soon after a body of horsemen who he suspected might be robbers. He was determined to leave his donkeys to save himself. He climbed up a large tree planted on a high rock whose branches were thick enough to conceal him and yet enabled him to see all that passed without being discovered. The troop, who were to the number of forty, all well mounted and armed, came to the foot of the rock on which the tree stood, and there dismounted. Every man unbridled his horse, tied him to some shrub, and hung about his neck a bag of corn which they brought behind them. Then each of them took off his saddlebag, which seemed to Ali Baba to be full of gold and silver from its weight. One whom he took to be their captain came under the tree in which Ali Baba was concealed, and making his way through some shrubs, pronounced these words, Open sesame! As soon as the captain of the robbers had thus spoken, a door opened in the rock, and after he had made all his troop enter before him. He followed them, when suddenly the door shut again of itself. The robbers stayed some time within the rock, during which Ali Baba, fearful of being caught, remained in the tree. At last, the door opened again, and as the captain went in last, so he came out first, and stood to see them all pass by him. When Ali Baba heard him make the door close, by pronouncing these words, Shut Sesame! Every man at once went and bridled his horse, fastened his wallet, and mounted again. When the captain saw them all ready, he put himself at their head, and they returned the way they had come. Ali Baba followed them with his eyes as far as he could see them, and afterward stayed a considerable time before he descended. Remembering the words the captain of the robbers used to cause the door to open and shut, he had the curiosity to try it if his pronouncing them would have the same effect. Accordingly, he went among the shrubs, and perceiving the door concealed behind them, stood before it, and said, Open, Sesame! The door instantly flew wide open. Ali Baba, who expected a dark, dismal cavern, was surprised to see a well-lighted and spacious chamber which received the light from an opening at the top of the rock, and in which were all sorts of provisions, rich bales of silk, stuff, brocade, and valuable carpeting, piled upon one another, gold and silver ingots in great heaps, and money in bags. The sight of all these riches made him suppose that this cave must have been occupied for ages by robbers, 
who had succeeded one another. Ali Baba went boldly into the cave and collected as much of the gold coin, which was in bags, as he thought his three donkeys could carry. When he had loaded them with bags, he laid wood over them in such a manner that they could not be seen. When he had passed in and out as often as he wished, he stood before the door and pronouncing the words, Shut Sesame, the door closed of itself. He then made the best of his way to town. When Ali Baba got home, he drove his donkeys into a little yard, shut the gates very carefully, threw off the wood that covered the panniers, carried the bags into his house, and ranged them in order before his wife. He then emptied the bags, which raised such a great heap of gold as dazzled his wife's eyes. And then he told her the whole adventure from beginning to end, and above all, recommended her to keep it secret. The wife rejoiced greatly in their good fortune, and would count all the gold piece by piece. Wife, replied Ali Baba, you do not know what you undertake. When you pretend to count the money, you will never have done. I will dig a hole and bury it. There is no time to be lost. You are right, husband, replied she. But let us know as nigh as possible how much we have. I will borrow a small measure and measure it while you dig the hole. Away the wife ran to her brother-in-law, Kasim, who lived just by, and addressing herself to his wife, desired her to lend her a measure for a little while. Her sister-in-law asked her whether she would have a great or a small one. The other asked for a small one. She bade her stay a little, and she would readily fetch one. The sister-in-law did so, but as she knew Ali Baba's poverty, she was curious to know what sort of grain his wife wanted to measure, and artfully putting some suit at the bottom of the measure, brought it to her, with an excuse that she was sorry that she had made her stay so long, but that she could not find it sooner. Ali Baba's wife went home, set the measure upon the heap of gold, filled it, and emptied it upon the sofa. When she had done, she was very well satisfied to find the number of measures amounted to so many as they did, and went to tell her husband, who had almost finished digging the hole. While Ali Baba was burying the gold, his wife, to show her exactness and diligence to her sister-in-law, carried the measure back again, but without taking notice that a piece of gold had stuck to the bottom. Sister, said she, giving it to her again. You see that I have not kept your measure long. I am obliged to you for it, and return it with thanks. As soon as Ali Baba's wife was gone, Kasim's wife looked at the bottom of the measure, and was in expressible surprise to find a piece of gold sticking to it. Envy immediately possessed her, what, said she, has Ali Baba gold so plentiful as to measure it? Whence has he all this wealth? Kasim, her husband, was at his counting house. When he came home, his wife said to him, Kasim, I know you think yourself rich, but Ali Baba is infinitely richer than you. He does not count his money, but measures it. Kasim desired her to explain the riddle, which she did, and showed him the piece of money, which was so old that they could not tell in what prince's reign it was coined. Kasim, after he had married the rich widow, had never treated Ali Baba as a brother, but neglected him, and now, 
instead of being pleased, he conceived a base envy at his brother's prosperity. He could not sleep all that night, and went to him in the morning before sunrise. Alibaba, said he, I am surprised at you. You pretend to be miserably poor, and yet you measure gold. My wife found this at the bottom of the measure you borrowed yesterday. By this discourse, Ali Baba perceived that Kasim and his wife, through his own wise folly, knew what they had so much reason to conceal. But what was done could not be undone. Therefore, without showing the least surprise or trouble, he confessed all and offered his brother part of his treasure to keep the secret. I expect as much, replied Kasim haughtily, but I must know exactly where this treasure is, and how I may visit it myself when I choose. Otherwise, I will go and inform against you, and then you will not only get no more, but will lose all you have, and I shall have a share for my information. Ali Baba told him all he desired, even to the very words he was to use to gain admission into the cave. Kasim rose the next morning, long before the sun, and set out for the forest with ten mules bearing great chests, which he designed to fill, and followed the road which Ali Baba had pointed out to him. He was not long before he reached the rock, and found out the place by the tree and other marks which his brother had given him. When he reached the entrance of the cavern, he pronounced the words, Open Sesame! The door immediately opened, and when he was in, closed upon him. He was in great admiration to find much more riches than he had expected. He quickly laid as many bags of gold as he could carry at the door of the cavern, but his thoughts were so full of great riches that he could not think of the necessary word to make it open. But instead of sesame, he said, Open barley, and was much amazed to find that the door remained fast shut. He named several sorts of grain, but still the door would not open. Kasim had never expected such an incident, and was so alarmed at the danger he was in, that the more he endeavored to remember the word sesame, the more his memory was confounded, and he had as much forgotten it as if he had never heard it mentioned. He threw down the bags he had loaded himself with, and walked distractedly up and down the cave, without having the least regard to the riches that were around him. About noon, the robbers visited their cave. At some distance, they saw Kasim's mules straggling about the rock, with great chests on their backs. Alarmed at this, they galloped full speed to the cave. They drove away the mules, strayed through the forest so far that they were soon out of sight, and went directly, with their naked sabers in their hand, approaching the door, which, on their captain pronouncing the proper words, immediately opened. Kasim, who heard the noise of the horse's feet, at once guessed the arrival of the robbers, and resolved to make one effort for his life. He rushed to the door, and no sooner saw the door open, than he ran out and threw the leader down, but could not escape the other robbers, who with their smithars soon deprived him of life. The first care of the robbers after this was to examine the cave. They found all the bags which Kasim had brought to the door, to be ready to load his mules, and carried them again to their places. But they did not miss what Ali Baba had taken away before. Then, holding a council, and deliberating upon this occurrence, 
They guessed that Kasim, when he was in, could not get out again, but could not imagine how he had learned the secret words by which alone he could enter. They could not deny the fact of his being there, and to terrify any person or accomplice who should attempt the same thing. They agreed to cut Kasim's body into four quarters, to hang two on one side and two on the other, within the door of the cave. They had no sooner taken this resolution than they put it in execution, and when they had nothing more to detain them, left the place of their hordes well closed. They mounted their horses, went to beat the roads again, and to attack the caravans they might meet. In the meantime, Kasim's wife was very uneasy when night came, and her husband was not returned. She ran to Ali Baba in great alarm, and said, I believe, brother-in-law, that you know Kasim is gone to the forest, and upon what account it is now night, and he has not returned. I am afraid some misfortune has happened to him. Ali Baba told her that she need not frighten herself, for that certainly Kasim would not think it proper to come into the town till the night should be pretty far advanced. Kasim's wife, considering how much it concerned her husband to keep the business secret, was the more easily persuaded to believe her brother-in-law. She went home again and waited patiently till midnight. Then her fear redoubled, and her grief was the more sensible it was forced to keep it to herself. She repented of her foolish curiosity, and cursed her desire of prying into the affairs of her brother and sister-in-law. She spent all the night in weeping, and as soon as it was day, went to them, telling them by her tears the cause of her coming. Ali Baba did not wait for his sister-in-law to desire him to go to see what has become of Kasim, but departed immediately with his three donkeys, begging of her first to moderate her affliction. He went to the forest, and when he came near the rock, having seen neither his brother nor the mules in his way, was seriously alarmed at finding some blood spilled near the door, which he took for an ill omen. But when he had pronounced the word, and the door had opened, he was struck with horror at the dismal sight of his brother's body. He was not long in determining how he should pay the last dues to his brother, but without adverting to the little fraternal affection he had shown for him, went into the cave to find something to enshroud his remains, and having loaded one of his donkeys with them, covered them over with wood. The other two donkeys he loaded with bags of gold, covering them with wood also as before, and then, bidding the door shut, came away, but was so cautious as to stop some time at the end of the forest, and he might not go into the town before night. When he came home, he drove the two donkeys loaded with gold into his little yard, and left the care of unloading them to his wife while he led the other to his sister-in-law's house. Ali Baba knocked at the door, which was opened by Morgiana, who was fruitful in inventions to meet the most difficult circumstances. When he came into the court, he unloaded the donkey, and taking Morgiana aside, said to her, You must observe an inviolable secrecy. Your master's body is contained in these two panniers. We must bury him as if he had died a natural death. Go now and tell your mistress. I leave the matter to your wit and skillful devices. Ali Baba helped to place the body in Kasim's house, again recommended to Morgiana to act her part well, and then returned with his donkey. Morgiana went out early the next morning to a druggist and asked for a sort of lozenge 
which was considered efficacious in the most dangerous disorders. The apothecary inquired who was ill. She replied with a sigh, her good master Kasim himself, and that he could neither eat nor speak. In the evening, Morgiana went to the same druggist again, and with tears in her eyes, asked for an essence which they used to give to sick people only when the last extremity. Alas, said she, taking it from the apothecary, I am afraid that this remedy will have no better effect than the lozenges, and that I shall lose my good master. On the other hand, as Ali Baba and his wife were often seen to go between Kasim's and their own house all that day, and to seem melancholy, nobody was surprised in the evening to hear the lamentable shrieks and cries of Kasim's wife and Morgiana, who gave out everywhere that her master was dead. The next morning, at daybreak, Morgiana went to an old cobbler whom she knew to be always early at his stall, and bidding him good morrow, put a piece of gold into his hand, saying, Baba Mustafa, you must bring with you your sewing tackle and come with me. But I must tell you, I shall blindfold you when you come to such a place. Baba Mustafa seemed to hesitate a little at these words. Oh, replied he, you would have me do something against my conscience or against my honor. God forbid, said Morgiana, putting another piece of gold into his hand. That I should ask anything that is contrary to your honor, only come along with me and fear nothing. Baba Mustafa went with Morgiana, who, after she had bound his eyes with a handkerchief at the place she had mentioned, conveyed him to her deceased master's house, and never unloosed his eyes till he had entered the room where she had put the corpse together. Baba Mustafa, said she, you must make haste and sew the parts of his body together. When you have done, I will give you another piece of gold. After Baba Mustafa had finished his task, she blindfolded him again, gave him the third piece of gold as she had promised and recommending secrecy to him, carried him back to the place where she first bound his eyes. She pulled off the bandage and let him go home, but watch him that he returned to his stall till he was quite out of sight, for fear he should have the curiosity to return and dodge her. She then went home. Morgiana, on her return, warmed some water to wash the body, and at the same time Ali Baba perfumed it with incense and wrapped it in the burying clothes with the accustomed ceremonies. Not long after the proper officer brought the buyer, and when the attendants of the mosque, whose business it was to wash the dead, offered to perform their duty, she told them that it was done already. Shortly after this, the Imaun and the other ministers of the mosque arrived. Four neighbors carried the corpse to the burying ground, following the Imaun, who recited some prayers. Ali Baba came after with some neighbors, who often relieved the others in carrying the buyer to the burying. Morjana followed in the procession, weeping beating her breast, and tearing her hair. Kasim's wife stayed at the home, mourning, uttering lamentable cries with the women of the neighborhood, who came according to the custom during the funeral and joining their lamentations with hers, filled the quarter far and near with sounds of sorrow. In this manner, Kasim's melancholy death was concealed and hushed up between Ali Baba his widow, and Morjana. With so much contrivance that nobody in the city had the least knowledge or suspicion of the cause of it. Three or four days after the funeral, Ali Baba removed his few goods openly to his sister-in-law's house, 
in which it was agreed that he should in future live. But the money he had taken from the robbers he conveyed thither by night. As for Kasim's warehouse, he entrusted it entirely to the management of his eldest son. While these things were being done, the forty robbers again visited their retreat in the forest. Then was their surprise to find Kasim's body taken away, with some of their bags of gold. We are certainly discovered, said the captain. The removal of the body and the loss of some of our money plainly shows that the man whom he killed had an accomplice, and for our own life's sake we must try and find him. What say you, my lads? All the robbers unanimously approved of the captain's proposal. Well, said the captain, one of you, the boldest and most skillful among you, must go into town, disguised as a traveler and a stranger, to try if he can hear any talk of the man whom he have killed, and endeavor to find out who he was and where he lived. This is a matter of the first importance, and for fear of any treachery, I propose that whoever undertakes this business without success, even though the failure arises only from an error of judgment, shall suffer death. Without waiting for the sentiments of his companions, one of the robbers started up and said, I submit to this condition and think it an honor to expose my life to serve the troop. After this robber had received great recommendations from the captain and his comrades, he disguised himself so that nobody would take him for what he was, and taking his leave of the troop that night, went into town just at daybreak, and walked up and down till accidentally he came to Baba Mustafa's stall, which was always open before any of the shops. Baba Mustafa was seated with an awl in his hand, just going to work. The robber saluted him, bidding him good morrow, and perceiving that he was old, said, Honest man, you begin to work very early. Is it possible that one of your age can see so well? I question, even if it were somewhat lighter, whether you could see the stitch. You do not know me, replied Baba Mustafa. For old as I am, I have extraordinary good eyes. And you will not doubt it when I tell you that I suit the body of a dead man together in a place where I had not so much light as I have now. A dead body, exclaimed the robber, with affected amazement. Yes, yes, answered Baba Mustafa. I see you want to have me speak out, but you shall know no more. The robber felt sure that he had discovered what he sought. He pulled out a piece of gold and, putting it into Baba Mustafa's hand, said to him, I do not want to learn your secret, though I can assure you you might safely trust me with it. The only thing I desire of you is to show me the house where you stitch up the dead body. If I were disposed to do you that favor, replied Baba Mustafa, I assure you I cannot. I was taken to a certain place whence I was led blindfold to the house, and afterward brought back again in the same manner. You see, therefore, the impossibility of my doing what you desire. Well, replied the robber, you may, however, remember a little of the way that you were led blindfold. Come, let me blind your eyes at the same place. We will walk together. Perhaps you may recognize some part. And as everybody ought to be paid for their trouble, there's another piece of gold for you. Gratify me in what I ask you. So saying, he put another piece of gold into his hand. The two pieces of gold were great temptations to Baba Mustafa. He looked at them long time in his hand without saying a word, but at last he pulled out his purse and put them in. I cannot promise said he to the robber, that I can remember the way exactly, but since you desire, I will try what I can do. At these words, Baba Mustafa rose up, 
to the great joy of the robber and led him to the place where Morgiana had bound his eyes. It was here, said Papa Mustafa. I was blindfolded, and I turned this way. The robber tied his handkerchief over his eyes and walked by him till he stopped directly at Kasim's house, where Ali Baba then lived. The thief, before he pulled off the band, marked the door with a piece of chalk, which he had ready in his hand, and then asked him if he knew whose house that was, to which Baba Mustafa replied that as he did not live in that neighborhood, he could not tell. The robber, finding he could discover no more from Baba Mustafa, thanked him for the trouble and left him to go back to his stall. While he returned to the forest, persuaded that he should be very well received. A little after the robber and Baba Mustafa had parted, Morjana went out of Ali Baba's house upon some errand, and upon her return, seeking the mark of the robber had made, stopped to observe it. What can be the meaning of this mark? said she to herself. Somebody intends my master no good. However, with whatever intention it was done, it is advisable to guard against the worst. Accordingly, she fetched a piece of chalk and marked two or three doors on each side, in the same manner without saying a word to her master or mistress. In the meantime, the robber rejoined the troop in the forest and recounted to them this success, expatiating upon his good fortune in meeting so soon with the only person who could inform him of what he wanted to know. All the robbers listened to him with the utmost satisfaction when the captain, after commending his diligence, addressing himself to the mall, said, We have no time to lose. Let us set off well armed, without its appearing who we are. But that we may not excite any suspicion, let only one or two go into the town together and join at our rendezvous, which shall be the great square. In the meantime, our comrade who brought us the good news and I will go and find the house, that we may consult what has best be done. The speech and plan was a proof of by all, and they were soon ready. They filed off in parties of two each, after some interval of time, and got into the town without being in the least suspected. The captain, and he who had visited town in the morning as spy, came in the last. He led the captain into the street where he had marked Ali Baba's residence, and when they came to the first of the houses which Morjana had marked, he pointed it out. But the captain observed that the next door was chalked in the same manner and in the same place, and showing it to his guide, asked him which house it was that or the first. The guide was so confounded that he knew not what answer to make, but still more puzzled when he and the captain saw five or six houses similarly marked. He assured the captain with an oath that he had marked but one and could not tell who had chalked the rest, so that he could not distinguish the house which the cobbler had stopped at. The captain, finding that their design had proved abortive, went directly to the place of the meeting and told his troop that they had lost their labor and must return to their cave. He himself set them an example and they all returned as they had come. When the troop was all got together, the captain told them the reason of their returning and presently the conductor was declared by all worthy of death. He condemned himself, acknowledging that he ought to have taken better precaution and prepared to receive the stroke from him who was appointed to cut off his head. But as the safety of the troop required the discovery of the second intruder into the cave, another of the gang, who promised himself he should succeed better, presented himself, and his offer being accepted. He went and corrupted Baba Mustafa as the other had done, and being shown the house, marked it in a place more remote from sight, with red chalk. Not long after, Morjana, whose eyes nothing could escape, went out, and seeing the red chalk, and arguing with herself as she had done before, marked the other neighbor's houses in the same place and manner. The robber, at his return to his company, 
valued himself much on the precaution he had taken, which he looked upon as an infallible way of distinguishing Ali Baba's house from the others, and the captain and all of them thought it must succeed. They convey themselves into the town with the same precaution as before. But when the robber and his captain came to the street, they found the same difficulty, at which the captain was enraged, and the robber in as great confusion as his predecessor. Thus the captain and his troop were forced to retire a second time, and much more dissatisfied. While the robber who had been the author of the mistake underwent the same punishment, to which he willingly submitted. The captain, having lost two brave fellows of his troops, was afraid of diminishing it too much by pursuing this plan to get information of the residence of their plunderer. He found by their example that their heads were not so good as their hands on such occasions, and therefore resolved to take upon himself the important commission. Accordingly, he went and addressed himself to Baba Mustafa, who did him the same service he had done to the other robbers. He did not set any particular mark of the house, but examined and observed it so carefully by passing often by it, that it was impossible for him to mistake it. The captain, well satisfied with his attempt, and informed of what he wanted to know, returned to the forest, and when he came into the cave, where the troop waited for him, said, Now, nothing can prevent our full revenge, as I am certain of the house and in my way hither I have thought how to put it into execution. But if any one can form a better expedient, let him communicate it. He then told them his contrivance, and as they approved of it, ordered them to go into the villages about and buy nineteen mules with thirty-eight large leather jars, one full of oil and the others empty. In two or three days' time, the robbers had purchased the mules and jars, and as the mouths of the jars were rather too narrow for his purpose, the captain caused them to be widened, and after having put one of his men into each, with the weapons which he thought fit, leaving open the seam which had been undone, to leave the room to breathe, he rubbed the jars on the outside with oil from the full vessel. Things being thus prepared, when the nineteen mules were loaded with thirty-seven robbers in jars and the jar of oil, the captain, as their driver, set out with them and reached the town by the dusk of the evening, as he had intended. He led them through the streets till he came to Ali Baba's, at whose door he designed to have knocked, but was prevented by his sitting there after supper to take a little fresh air. He stopped his mules addressed himself to him, and said, I have brought some oil a great way to sell at tomorrow's market, and it is now so late that I do not know where to lodge. If I should not be troublesome to you, do me the favor to let me pass the night with you, and I shall be very much obliged by your hospitality. Though Ali Baba had seen the captain of the robbers in the forest and had heard him speak, it was impossible to know him in the disguise of an oil merchant. He told him he should be welcome, and immediately opened his gates for the mules to go into the yard, and then went to Morjana to bid her get a good supper for his guest. After they had finished supper, Ali Baba charging Morjana afresh to take care of his guest, said to her, Tomorrow morning I designed to go to the bath before day. Take care my bathing linen be ready, and make me some good broth against my return. After this, he went to bed. In the meantime, the captain of the robbers went into the yard, and took off the lid of each jar, and gave his people orders what to do. Beginning at the first jar, and so on to the last, he said to each man, As soon as I throw some stones out of the chamber window where I lie, do not fail to come out, and I will immediately join you. After this, he returned into the house when Morgiana, taking up a light, conducted him to his chamber where she left him, and he, to avoid any suspicion, put the light out soon after, and laid himself down in his clothes, that he might be the more ready to rise. 
Morgiana, remembering Ali Baba's orders, got his bathing linen ready and ordered Abdallah to set on the pot for the broth. But while she was preparing it, the lamp went out, and there was no more oil in the house, nor any candles. What to do, she did not know, for the broth must be made. Abdallah, seeing her very uneasy, said, Do not fret and tease yourself, but go into the yard and take some oil out of one of the jars. Morjana thanked Abdallah for his advice, took the oil pot, and went into the yard. When, as she came nigh to the first jar, the robber within said softly, Is it time? Though naturally, much surprised at finding a man in the jar instead of the oil she wanted, she immediately felt the importance of keeping silence, as Ali Baba, his family, and herself were in great danger. And collecting herself, without showing the least emotion, she answered, Not yet, but presently. She went quietly in this manner to all the jars, giving the same answer, till she came to the jar of oil. By this means, Morjana found that her master Ali Baba had admitted thirty-eight robbers into the house. She made what haste she could to fill her oil pot, and returned into her kitchen, where, as soon as she had lighted her lamp, she took a great kettle, went again to the oil jar, filled the kettle, set it on a large wood fire, and as soon as it boiled, went and poured enough into every jar to stifle and destroy the robber within. When this action, worthy of the courage of Morgiana, was executed without any noise, as she had projected, she returned to the kitchen with the empty kettle, and having put out the great fire she had made to boil the oil, and leaving just enough to make the broth, put out the lamp also, and remained silent, resolving not to go to rest till she had observed what might follow through a window of the kitchen. She had not waited long before the captain of the robbers got up, opened the window, and finding no light, and hearing no noise or anyone stirring in the house, gave the appointed signal by throwing little stones, several of which hit the jars, as he doubted not by the sound they gave. He then listened, but not hearing or perceiving anything whereby he could judge that his companions stirred. He began to grow very uneasy, threw stones again, a second and also a third time and could not comprehend the reason that none of them should answer the signal. Much alarmed, he went softly down into the yard, and going to the first jar, while asking the robber, whom he thought alive, if he was in readiness, smelt the hot-boiled oil, which sent forth a steam out of the jar. Hence, he suspected that his plot to murder Ali Baba and plunder his house was discovered. Examining all the jars, one after the other, he found that all his gang were dead, and, enraged to despair at having failed in his design, he forced a lock of a door that led from the yard to the garden, and climbing over the walls, and made his escape. When Morjana saw him depart, she went to bed, satisfied and pleased to have succeeded so well in saving her master and family. Upon the next morning, Morjana told Ali Baba every little detail of what had transpired that evening. On hearing these brave deeds from the lips of Morjana, Ali Baba said to her, God, by your means, has delivered me from the snares of these robbers laid for my destruction. I owe, therefore, my life to you, and for the first token of my acknowledgement, give you your liberty from this moment, till I can complete your recompense as I intend. From that moment on, Morjana is free. Ali Baba thanked her by giving her the life that she always wanted. The end. Hey, baby. Are you asleep? <laughs> Look at you. You must have been really, really tired, huh? <laughs> Alright. I'll 
leave you in here to properly rest, okay? Thanks for listening to my story. Good night, baby. And sweet dreams.